know, they're, they're, and that, see, that's what you all are doing. This is not, you're, you're here, you're not going to be here tomorrow if at the end of the day you can't pay your bills. You know what I mean? You've got employees, you've got obligations. And, you know, our view is that if there's a level playing field, you can actually compete uh, economically as well as, uh, Jeff, what you just said, appeal to people's sense of wanting to have some control over uh, improving the environment. I don't know if anybody has any questions about Washington. I mean, it's also something. <laughs> <laughs> so I do. Tell us about the bill and what, where it goes and what its prospects are. Yeah, what's are you going to tack it onto something else, or is it freestanding? Well, the, 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 the bill is a freestanding bill. In, in, there's a, you know, how you get from here to there in the legislative process is in whatever, you, whatever you can do, you try to do it, and whether you can tack it onto another bill or not, or get past it's a freestanding bill. Uh, this is sort of uh, situation, okay? But what the, the, the approach that I'm taking is to build a, across the board support. And uh, the, the uh, now again, Andrew was so helpful in getting us sort of solidly uh, established in Congress on this whole question of renewable and energy efficiency that I've been talking to the chair of the committee, Mr. Upton. Uh, uh, and also with Jeff Merkley and Lisa Murkowski. We had a meeting with a few others last week. And they're looking for ways to do something in the energy space, okay? And this definitely can be one of them. The legislative politics that are difficult is that anything that gets involved with either spending a dollar or the tax code gets sucked into that maw of the macro battle about uh, taxing and spending. And that's where there's got to be, like, there, that's the challenge, because there's a, there, this is an idea that I actually think would have a lot of merit if we got it on the floor. There would be a lot of people on both sides supporting it, okay? Um, but <clears throat> anything that uh, it even comes at all close to the tax code, it's almost put on stall because there's this notion that we're going to come up with the perfect tax code revision, all right? So, there's a lot of letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in Washington. But what's the other part of this uh, is that Congress, I think, after this last election, is understanding it does have to do things. And it may be that we're going to be in this divided Congress that we have uh, with kind of the Tea Party majority on the Republican side in the House that on um, some of these macro budget issues, the grand bargain, which most of us think would be ideal, uh, that even if we can't reach that grand bargain style agreement, there are lots of things below that level where we have common ground and it makes sense uh, to then do those things. And that's essentially the challenge that I have on this and many other things. But we're, I mean, we're making some, I'm, I'm feeling somewhat optimistic about that. You know, I have Republicans coming up to me and asking about it what some of these bills are and can they, can they work on it. So, I would we'll imagine several of us um, you know, have contacts in, in other states. Are there um, things that we can do to try and support? Are there certain states, certain legislators in terms of you know, H.R. 6437 and Senate 4275? Yeah. If you know, if you have colleagues, you know, the member of Congress in any district who's sitting down with your counterparts, and they're in all these other districts, you know, even in the oil country, you know, people like you there. And they're talking to their member of Congress, and they're talking about jobs and just running the playing field. That's, that's the kind of thing that a member of Congress really listens to. Jobs, jobs, jobs. So, you know, um, if you have counterparts, and they're in especially some of, the, some of the Republican districts, and they hear it, that is helpful. It's quite helpful. You know, I'll throw one other thing out while you're thinking about massive limited partnerships. Yeah. I think it's a good effort, and um, I suspect it'll be successful, which is, which is good. I think it'll be helpful. I am struck by the conversation about homeowners, individual folks wanting to make an investment in renewables. Right. And I sort of step back and say, why aren't they just buying solar rather than buying an investment in a massive limited partnership that's invested in solar? 
And so, you know, part of that comes down to just a different class of, of, of individual, those who have some money to invest and those who would like to do solar who don't. Right. But at the end of the day, I think most people will agree that the most efficient way for a homeowner to take advantage of renewable energy is for them to buy it themselves and own it over the life of the asset. I mean, logic right. would say that as much as I like Luke, and I know that he has kids he needs to feed, if you can take the financing person out of the equation and finance it yourself, <laughs> Luke, should I just stop now, or am I okay still? <laughs> so, uh, the PACE program is a good program that allows... the sales department? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, soon, I'm soon to be no department, I think. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, the PACE program is a good program because it allows homeowners right. to get the money to do that, exactly. and the concept you mentioned of moving out of your house in three years, you don't have to worry about that investment not being valued by someone who might want to buy it. But I just throw out, I think, I think that financing is good. I think it carries higher costs than uh -huh. it otherwise might need to. It makes it a less attractive investment. But as a general theme, you point, don't let the perfect be be good. The MLP is good. Let's not go for the perfect yet. But I think as a general theme, we should be thinking about ways to get individual investors more comfortable and make it easier for them to make those individual investments in solar, that's really what it's going to get them the long-term energy security, buy the investment up front, own their energy source for the rest of the, the rest of the life of that house. No, you're right, but I just, as a homeowner, know that when you're looking at a decision where, let's say it's 20 or 30 or you said $100,000, that's a big decision uh, for people uh, as opposed to, let's say, you're going to put $5,000, which may be a lot of money to you, in an IRA, uh, and you can direct it towards uh, uh, an MLP that does renewable energy. Mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, I see those as two really different decisions for that family, you know what I mean? Uh, there will always be a... And there's a, there's a I, I think one of the challenges, I don't like this, I mean, I, we, ju we did some uh, energy efficiency work in our home. But, you know, we didn't do it all, and we're looking at it, and you kind of, when you actually get to writing the check, you're kind of wondering, you know, is this really going to work out? If I wait a year, will it be cheaper? I mean, there's all kinds of ways to procrastinate when making these decisions. You guys have seen it, right? So, all of the above is kind of the approach I take. I yeah. think, I, you know, I can cut down some trees and get a little bit more sunlight on my house, but I still can't quite cover all my yeah. needs. And I don't have a hilltop. So if I could work with somebody who could actually give me a diversified energy portfolio and have multiple types of alternative energy for my home, or at least be invested in that, that would be dramatically safer for me. Yeah, an and you know, one of the things that we're getting out here too is that uh, there is there is a counterattack on renewable energy efforts by by. Uh, and there's a, there's a, there's a, the implicit uh, and sometimes explicit assertion uh, that it's a free ride. I mean, that's the whole solidity, yeah. right? And you know what? We dispute that. I mean, the reality is, it isn't a level playing field. It's, it's stacked against renewables. So it, part of this is we've just got to make that case that, hey, we want a level playing field, you know? I do like the concept of, uh, of MLPs providing a um, readily available investment structure for renewables, to essentially mainstreaming renewables for the homeowner that might be wondering, is this, is this for real or not? Or the, you know, the investor on Wall Street or the investor in Westchester County wondering if this is real or not. I think the more things that vehicles people have that provide a stable return, the more renewables become commonplace to so the bank that won't look at renewables in its own community um, all the way down. So I think that is something no, that to is that. that is amazing. I mean, it, in the marketplace, there have to be viable, efficient, and easy to use financing structures. You can't go to scale without financing. I mean, the problem with American capital in the last several years has been it's all been about making money on moving money as opposed to uh, making money by building a productive economy. You know? so part of the <coughs> public capital mobilization and you know, this lender and investor standards and the underwriting requirements <coughs> of deals and transactions. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we as a whole, everyone in this room should maybe start thinking about as we try to apply this on a Vermont scale to Vermont sized projects. I mean, the reality is we're not ever going to have utility scale projects that we're developing in the state. We've got a lot of small residential, small commercial projects. We want to think about 
doing it on a Vermont scale and mobilizing a lot of money, think about open source contracts that will satisfy lenders, investors, who are going to be investing in these projects that everyone can use. Not just me and my firm, but everybody in this room that's got a project that fits in the parameter, an open source contract that I've got a quick question about PACE. I've been an advocate of PACE for years since it first came out, um, and I've been listening to Efficiency Vermont tell me it's going to be $9 million, and now, well, we've, we might have a million dollars. And here's, a, here's an organization that could really uh, roll this program out, uh, and they can't get a million dollars? Um, they just announced the other day that they don't have the funding, and... Uh, on the street, the homeowners that want this, that have been riled up in, by their local energy committees, um, Bob Walker and your wife, for, for an example, have been doing a lot of work on this, and <clears throat> there's no money. And so now the people are uh, have uh, arranged to have an, an energy efficient upgrade done on their house, but they can't get any money to do it. So I just wonder who's behind that, and why isn't that working? And a million dollars? We could come up with a million dollars in this room. Not for me, but... <laughs> so I just wonder about that, because we've got 185,000 houses or so in Vermont that were built prior to 1978, and each and every one of them needs an energy-efficient upgrade. But there's no money. I think there's money that the lenders and investors are saying that they want investment-quality contracts. And how, do you, how do you crack that? Nut? How do you come up with an investment quality contract for a, a residential project. Well, I think on, I'm sorry, on the PACE side, I don't, I can't speak to it as well as you would like, but, you know, that was obviously, it ran into some issues with first and second opportunities on mortgages right. that um, the federal um, mortgage backed folks said they didn't like, and I think we're sort of somewhat past those hurdles, and I believe that was sort of a year or two delay in the program really getting going, and so I don't know the answer to why there isn't any money, but I get the sense from the folks at the EIC, Peter Damchik and others, that mm -hmm. this is something that's still coming. The reality is that what I understand reading through the tea leaves is if an entity can go out and they can typically go out and borrow money cheaper themselves if they've got good credit and borrow money. But you understand the PACE program's potential is all in the fact that I can leave in three years and uh, allow the new homeowner to pick up the liability of the remaining balance. So the, the ability for people to do an upgrade on their house, knowing that they're not gonna, they might not be there for 30 years to get the return, they're having to walk away from that and in the meantime they're paying more for energy they're paying you know they're just more uncomfortable their house isn't as valuable as it would have been if they'd done the upgrade and to think that we can't come up with a million dollars I mean that is that's just a drop in the bucket of what we really need to make that program work well listen I want to I want to thank everybody I'm thinking of if you want me to keep you posted on this give us your emails and we'll do it uh, because I'm working on this and a, a bunch of other things in the energy space, and it's where I'm putting a lot of my time because I see it as uh, really potentially quite productive. You know, the home started. Uh